last portion we have been uh, discussing from uh, Ch Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now uh, we will be, uh, yeah, uh, we are just, I mean, uh, planning to, uh, I mean, uh, study from uh, the uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Uh, that is the point number six, the church at Philadelphia. The church at Philadelphia. So that is the, I mean, next church. And uh, we already covered uh, the five, I mean, five churches and all the messages and everything uh, on, on the churches. Now we are, I mean, uh, studying about uh, the sixth church. That is the church at uh, Philadelphia. Okay. So the Philadelphia church is known as a, as a faithful church. Uh, because of many reasons. There are many reasons that, that uh, uh, the church at Philadelphia is known as the faithful church. So that will be, I mean, uh, looking into that points later. Now we will, I mean, first of all, we will be, I mean, thinking about uh, uh, point number A, point number A, the city where the church was located. The city where the church was located. So we will just I mean, study uh, something about uh, the uh, city where the church was located. Uh, then after that, uh, we'll be just move, we'll be moving on to the messages for the churches and everything. Um, and there are many things to study about uh, the church at Philadelphia uh, because uh, this church is entirely different from the <clears throat> other churches. There are many reasons for that. So uh, when we study about uh, the city, where the church was located. The city uh, is located around 30 miles away from Sardis. So we have been st studying about Sardis, previous class. And now this city of Philadelphia is located around 30 miles away from uh, Sardis. And uh, uh, one king's name is written there. That is uh, the King uh, Atlas. The King Atlas II was the founder of this city. King Atlas II was the founder of this city. Um, and also the nickname of uh, Atlas II was Philadelphus. Philadelphus was the nickname of Atlas II, the king. And Philadelphus means brotherly love. Philadelphus means brotherly love. And all these things we'll be explaining later. Uh, when we study about the church at, I mean, uh, Philadelphia, just I'm giving you uh, some of the points, that's all, okay. So the word Philadelphia is derived from two Greek words. The word Philadelphia is derived from two Greek words. The first Greek word is philio, and the second word is adelphos. The first Greek word for uh, Philadelphia is philio, then the second one is Adelphos. And Philio means to love. Adelphos means brother. Philio means to love. And Adelphos is, means brother. The another thing is, this city is also known as the gateway to the east. The city is also known as the gateway to the east and the treasure house of Greek culture and the treasure house of Greek culture. There are some reasons to uh, call that city of Philadelphia as the gateway to the east and the treasure house of the Greek culture. Because, you know, you know because of the invasion of uh, Greek culture in 19th century, in 19th century because of the invasion of Greek culture. That means the Greek culture and Greek people uh, entered into this city and uh, the Greek language also uh, became the regional language in those days. You know, because of the invasion of the Greek culture and Greek people and uh, Greek uh, leaders and emperors, you know, uh, the Greek language became the region, uh, regional language of uh, the city of Philadelphia. So the city also was known as the Little Athens. The city also was known as the Little Athens because there were many Greek temples and idol worship centers in that city. So the city was known as 
the little Athens. Little Athens because there were many Greek temples and idol worship centers. So that was the reason that the city was known as the Little Athens. And another thing is, the city of Philadelphia was famous for the grape cultivation and business. The city of Philadelphia was famous for the grape cultivation and business. So there were many gardens and uh, I mean uh, uh, cultivation of the grape and uh, that was the one of the main business in uh, uh, the city of uh, Philadelphia. So that's what we read from the history. And in all other cities, uh, another thing is in all other cities, emperor uh, uh, emperor worship was compulsory. But in the sit in this city, it was not insisted or it was not compulsory. Okay. So when you study about the other churches, we have we have been seeing about uh, the other churches that uh, uh, the emperor worship was uh, a must and compulsory. But uh, uh, regarding this city of uh, Philadelphia, the emperor worship was not uh, compulsory. At the same time, there were many. And in Greek culture and Greek temples, and also uh, uh, Greek, lang uh, Greek language became the regional language of uh, uh, that city in 19th century. Okay, now uh, we will go to the point number B. So that 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 that's it about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the city where the church is located. Now we will go to the point number B. That is the church at Philadelphia. The church at Philadelphia. <clears throat> The church at Philadelphia. Yeah. Regarding the church at Philadelphia, nothing is recorded in the Bible about the establishment of the Philadelphia church. You know, while we were uh, studying about the other churches, uh, we have seen that, I mean, uh, there are some clues about uh, who planted or who established the churches, but, uh, but for some other churches, you know, there is no clue at all. Uh, this is one of the church in, in that, I mean, in that group, you know, nothing is recorded in the Bible about the establishment of the Philadelphia church. And, uh, but it is believed that Apostle Paul, you know, while he was uh, visiting and uh, ministering in Ephesus, you know, most of the places, Apostle Paul visited uh, many times in Ephesus and uh, he was traveling from Ephesus to many other places. So it is believed that, I mean, he, while he was visiting and ministering in Ephesus, he also visited and planted a church in Philadelphia. He also visited and planted a church in Philadelphia. That is the belief now that we can, we can think. And it is, it is believed that, that both uh, the Sardis church and also the Philadelphia church were planted during the same time. The Sardis church and the church at Philadelphia were planted during the same time. And another thing is uh, uh, for the church at Smyrna and Philadelphia, there is no mention about any accusation or rebuke or the word of repent from God. The other churches, we understand that, uh, I mean, uh, God is, I mean, uh, accusing them uh, for something and rebuking them uh, for their mistakes and weak points and everything. Or uh, uh, God is saying them that you have to repent from your sins and repent from the weak. I mean, areas. But here, uh, only for the Church of Smyrna and the Philadelphia Church, there is nothing is mentioned about uh, any accusation or rebuke or uh, the word, I mean, of repent. Uh, that, uh, that, I mean, that is, that's what we see there. And, and, uh, and also, no weak points are recorded about the Philadelphia Church. There is no weak point recorded about Philadelphia Church. And we will be seeing what is the reason that God, Jesus is not uh, mentioning or, I mean, suggesting any uh, weak points uh, of uh, this church. And also, uh, they received more promises than the other six churches. You know? They received more promises. The other churches also have the promises. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, this church, the Church of Philadelphia, also received more promises than the other churches. And uh, um, and also, we can see that uh, this, uh, I mean, church at Philadelphia uh, could set a good example for the universal church in many things. Okay, this is this this is the, the church at Philadelphia uh, was a good example for 
the universal church in many things like uh, in unity and in love and in uh, spiritual vision and in perfection okay so that we will see when we study about the messages which was given for the church at philadelphia so uh, during the time the, when we are when we are studying that the unity and the church was uh, made famous for the unity and it was famous for the love uh, brotherly love and the spiritual vision and the perfection okay so that's what we see from this point and now we will go to the uh, point number c point number c that is uh, four titles of jesus four titles of jesus um okay any one of you can read uh, i mean chapter 3 verse 7 and to the angel of the church in philadelphia right the words of the holy one the true one who has the key of david who opens and no one will shut who shuts and no one opens okay so uh, that is what you know the first one is uh, he who is holy okay uh, you know in this particular verse verse number 7 we can see four titles of jesus that means jesus is introducing himself in a particular way uh, that uh, he is mentioning uh, four things four titles i mean so that's what we see from this verse the first one is he who is holy he who is holy so the greek word which is used for holy is hagios hagios is the greek word which is used for holy uh which means different or separated one different or separated one so that is the meaning of hagios the greek word um you know when you study the bible uh, there are many bible verses uh which shows uh, jesus is the most holy one <clears throat> okay here i told you that uh, jesus is introducing himself as a uh, as a holy that means he who is holy so the reason is you know in bible we can see that in in many places that uh, i mean there are many bible verses which shows jesus is the most holy one jesus is the most holy one uh, so remember one thing that we can we the human beings are not uh, i mean uh, permitted to take the name most holy one but we are called as the saints and holy people by the washing of the blood of jesus christ right you know we cannot call ourselves as or we cannot call any other human being as the most holy person there is nobody in the world most holy one god jesus is only known as the most holy one most holy one so in malayalam uh, we used to say that parishuddhan okay so that parishuddhan and the vaak orikkalum namukku manushyar kaarkum kodukkan patti vaakalla vishuddharana nammalokke nammalokke we are the saints we are the holy people but we are not the most holy people so we are not supposed to we are not permitted to take that name for any human being but we are known and we are called as the saints and the holy people by the washing of the blood of jesus christ now the second title is uh, he who is true he who is true <clears throat> that also is in the same verse only verse number 7 he who is true <clears throat> so here you can see one word used true so it says that jesus is true jesus is true you now the greek word which is used for true is alethinos alethinos is the greek word which is used for true which means real and genuine real and genuine you know we understand one thing that jesus christ only is the true person or he is the real person or he is a genuine person he is the genuine person when you read bible especially the new testament even in the old testament also there are many prophetical words by many prophets speaking about uh, jesus christ that jesus christ is going to be the faithful one and jesus christ is going to be the holy one and jesus christ will be the righteous person who will be ruling the people in a righteous way okay 
So we understand Jesus only is the true person who got birth into this world. So that's what we read that true, the word true. That means Lethinos means, I mean, real or genuine. So we will read John chapter 14, uh, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6. Yeah. Yes, Elsa. Jesus, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, here also we can see that Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus himself said, I am the truth. I am the truth. I am the truth. So that's the reason that he is introducing himself that he who is true. That means this message for the church at Philadelphia is coming from, coming from he who is true. Jesus is true, Jesus is real, and Jesus is the only genuine one. Now, we will see the third uh, title of Jesus Christ, which is mentioned in this, in this but, I mean, uh, uh, verse uh, number seven, that is, he who has the key of David, he who has the key of David, he who has the key of David. Uh, there are some of the verses uh, I mean, mentioned there uh, in your slide, uh, but we are not going to uh, read all those vers verses, but uh, let me explain something about uh, this point. He who has the key of David. So what does it mean? That means, you know, why it is said that, okay, Jesus is holding the key of David. Why it is said Jesus is holding or Jesus is keeping or having the key of David. Uh, we will go to that point. Maybe uh, let us read uh, uh, two verses from Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 10. Yeah, Isaiah chapter verses chapter 11, verses 1 and 10. Yeah. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. 10 notes. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a sing, single signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Okay, so in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, prophet Isaiah says, A shoot will come up from the stem of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And in verse 10, it says that, and it is written again, the anointed one will come from the family of Jesse. That means, you know, even in the Old Testament itself, Jesus is known as the, I mean, a generation uh, of uh, David or Jesse. So that's the reason that it says that a shoot will come up from the stem of Jesse, from his roots, the branch will bear fruit. And also it is written, I know anointed one, that is Jesus Christ. The anointed one will come from the family of Jesse. Okay, so Jesse is the, is the father of David. And it says that Jesus is coming from that family. Okay, and uh, again, in, 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 in gospel, that means uh, in Matthew chapter uh, one, verses 1 through 17, when you read uh, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse, uh, uh, I mean, uh, verse 1 through 17, we are not going to read that verses because we know that. I mean, uh, that, it, that all, always speaks about uh, the genealogy of uh, the people, that means uh, about Jesus Christ also. And also in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 also, you know, when you read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, we will read that verse, yeah. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Okay, so when you read, when you compare with uh, Matthew chapter 1 uh, and also uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, uh, we can see that the father and mother of Jesus is from the genealogy of David. The father and mother of Jesus is from the genealogy of David. Okay, so... Uh, in that way, we can say that Jesus is holding or keeping the key of David. Okay, we'll be looking into that. I mean, more about, I mean, we'll be studying more about that later. 
but uh, uh, just understand that jesus is having the key of uh, uh, of david that means that means you know uh, uh, jesus is from the genealogy of uh, david and his i mean parents also is from the genealogy of uh, I mean, uh, I mean, David or Jesse. Okay, so usually the the holding the key. Okay, the the particular usage which is uh, written there is holding the key, holding the key. That represents the authority or the right of a person holding the key. Okay, for for example, I mean, if you are locking something and you if you are keeping a key, and if somebody is asking, can you give that key? Or uh, I mean, if somebody is asking, okay, just give me that key. then you will say okay, no 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 i cannot give this because uh, something special or something precious is inside the uh, in, inside the box i mean uh, the key of that box is with me and i'm holding this and i have the authority i have the right to open that i mean box or almara okay so the bureau okay so that is what we we used to usually say so usually the ho- the, the holding the key means the i mean uh, repres- uh, means the authority or the right which we, which a person is having but here jesus is holding the key means he has the authority to open and close anything and also his authority over both the jews and the gentiles so just think about what is the meaning that it is it says that jesus is holding the key jesus is holding the key of david okay that means he has the authority jesus has the authority to open and also jesus has the authority to close anything and also his authority over both the jews and the gentiles so he is having the key of david means he is having the authority over the jewish people and also jesus is having the authority over the gentile people also okay so that's the meaning of that i mean holding the key jesus is holding the key now in the book of revelation there are three kinds of keys in the book of revelation itself there are three kinds of keys mentioned or i mean recorded we will go to that point the first one is the key of death and hades the key of death and hades that is from revelation chapter 1 verse 18 revelation chapter 1 verse 18 says there is a key of death and hades and the second key is the key of david the key of david revelation chapter 3 verse 7 the, this this one yeah we we have been studying about that one revelation chapter 3 verse 7 the key of david and the third one is the key of bottomless pit the key of bottomless pit that is from revelation chapter 9 verse 1 revelation chapter 9 verse 1 so these are the three i mean three keys i mean about which uh, it is mentioned in the book of revelation now uh, when you go to the gospels go to the gospels there are uh, two uh, i mean about two keys are mentioned there there are two keys mentioned in uh, in gospels in especially in matthew and also in photo <laughs> the key yeah i'll give you you right here okay what is that the first one is the key of the kingdom of heaven the key of the kingdom of heaven is the first one in matthew chapter 16 verse 19 <clears throat> the key of the kingdom of heaven in matthew chapter 16 verse 19 and the key of knowledge second one the key of knowledge that is in uh, luke chapter 11 verse 52 luke chapter 11 verse 52 okay this is what we see from the third point that is he who has the key of david uh that speaks about jesus jesus is i mean introducing himself that he has the key of david okay so that is the meaning of that usage now we will go to the fourth title of jesus christ which is mentioned in the 
verse number seven. And that it is like this, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So that is the fourth title, which is mentioned here in this verse about Jesus Christ. He who opens and no one shuts and he shuts and no one can open it. Arkham Adakuan Karia Turakanum, Arkuan Turakuan, Arkham Turakuan Karia, Adakinum, Yeshu Christ. Now, let us go to Isaiah chapter twenty two, verse twenty two. Isaiah chapter twenty two, verse twenty two. Yeah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall mm -hmm. open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. Yeah. Here in this, in, in this uh, verse, Prophet Isaiah says about Jesus. Okay. Even though uh, that is a uh, prophetical book, the book of Isaiah is a prophetical book. And in that book, uh, even I mean, many, many, many years ago, uh, Prophet Isaiah says about Jesus that I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. This is a particular verse which is speaking about uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, So that means uh, the sovereignty and omnipotence of Jesus Christ. The sovereignty and omnipotence of Jesus Christ. So remember one thing that Jesus can open the way and he can close the way also. So it says that Jesus has the authority and Jesus has the sovereignty and Jesus has the power and authority to open something. And also he has the authority to close the door or close something. You know, sometimes when uh, in our experience also, in our, I mean, uh, Christian life experience, uh, when some of the doors are open, most of the time we are so happy about that, right? When some of the doors are open, you know, when we are getting some good things and when the opportunities, come, opportunities are coming, we'll be so happy and we'll be sharing to others and we'll say, okay, I got this opportunity and I got this job or I got, I, I, I got this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, opening, all those things. But sometimes when certain doors are closed, before us, are we getting upset or disturbed? This is what just I want to uh, ask you this question that you know, sometimes when the doors are open, when the opportunities are open, when everything is okay, we are so happy. At the same time, certain times, you know, some doors are closed before us. And uh, sometimes we are getting upset and we are some getting, I mean, disturbed. And we are asking God and the other people why this door is closed. Remember one thing, God has the authority to open something and also God has the authority to close or shut the door. That means it is the purpose of God. It is the will of God. Sometimes, you know, that may be a good for you. That may be a, a, a beneficiary for you. Sometimes, you know, uh, remember that, you know, when some of the doors are closed, do not be upset or do not be disturbed or anything. Do not be worried about all those things because God, Jesus will open the way for us when it seems the doors are closed before us. Amen. So believe that. So even though this is a Bible study, let me encourage you all this uh, I mean, evening time that, you know, sometimes when you see that, okay, the doors are closed, there is nothing to expect. No, it is not there. It is not like that. I mean, when God is, I mean, I mean, closing something, Praise God and say, oh Lord, I mean, I believe that you are going to open the other way for me. When one door is, is closed, <clears throat> when one way is closed, the seven doors will be opened by the, by the Lord. Amen. So let us believe that and let us thank God that you, I mean, close the door and sometimes he's, I mean, opening the doors for the people of God. Amen. So let us, I mean, pray for that and let us all, I mean, I mean, uh, praise God for that. Now. We will go to the point number D. Point number D, 
uh, that is the messages to the church at Philadelphia. Messages to the church at Philadelphia. Messages to the church at Philadelphia. That is from Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Revelation chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 8 through 10. Uh, we will read that portion first, then we will go through the uh, explanations. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have, I know you, but, but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews, but are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you before, because you have kept my word and patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try to try those who dwell on the earth. Thank you, Elsa. Great. Okay, so you know I already I mean mentioned you and I mean told you that uh, no weak points are mentioned about this church. There is nothing is written about the weak point about the, this church in this passage. But Jesus is appreciating them for many things. Jesus is appreciating them for many things. Which are the things that uh, Jesus is appreciating the church at Philadelphia? Uh, so now we will go to the appreciations. Point number A. Point number A. Appreciations. The first appreciation which is given for the church at Philadelphia is you have a little power, but you kept the word of Jesus. You have a little power, but you kept the word of Jesus. Okay, so especially it is written about uh, in uh, church at Philadelphia that uh, you have a little power or little strength. You can call it as like that. You have a little power or little strength. Now, when you when you read that portion, yeah, we may be thinking that, okay, uh, the church at Philadelphia, uh, already you said that, okay, it is, it is a faithful church and it is a loving church and uh, they are okay with everything and they, that's a, it's, a, it's a perfect a church of perfection. But now why uh, Jesus is saying that, okay, oh, church at Philadelphia, you are having a little power or you are weak. But how to understand one thing? Uh, this doesn't mean that they are spiritually weak. Okay, This doesn't mean that they are spiritually weak. Rather, this speaks about this, uh, maybe maybe the, 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 uh, the, a small congregation or few in number, Okay, the believers of the church might be. We, we are not sure about that, but uh, uh, the, the word, the particular word, which is uh, a little power or little strength is used, used uh, uh, as a meaning of uh, uh, they are having uh, only only few number, only few number, or a small congregation. It was not a big church or something, but it was a few congregation, a few number of congregation. And uh, the other thing is their resources may be uh, small, their resources may be uh, small, or uh, they may be financially weak or weak in the matter of knowledge. These are the meanings which is given for the little power or little strength. Okay. They may be uh, financially weak or uh, they are weak in the matter of knowledge. Uh, in that way, uh, Jesus is speaking that, okay, you have little power. You have little power. But the appreciation is very interesting. No? What is the appreciation? Okay, For this search that you have a little power, but you kept my word. That is very important. They have a little power or in number they are few. Okay. In knowledge, they are weak. Financially, they are weak. They have nothing to boast about. Even then, these people kept the word of God. They kept the word of God. Let me tell you one thing this evening. Even if we are weak in many areas, you know, we say that, okay, we are weak in many areas. We can do that and we can do this. And most of the time we say, we, we pray and we cry in the presence of God. Oh Lord, I don't have that talent and I don't have that wisdom. I don't have that knowledge about all those things. And I'm weak and weak and weak. 
But let me tell you one thing, do not be worried about that because our God is able to use the weak to demonstrate his power if you are faithful in the presence of God. If you feel that you are a weak person, when you compare with other people of the church, you feel that, okay, I am a weak person. I cannot say anything in front of the people. I don't know anything. I'm not capable enough to speak something. Or, I mean, the other people, they have the talent of singing. They have the talent of preaching. Or they have many talents and gifts and everything. I don't have anything. I am a poor person and I am a weak person. Sometimes we speak in that way. But just remember one thing. Our God is able to use the weak person to demonstrate his power. But only condition is we must be faithful in the presence of God. We must be faithful in the presence of God. If you are faithful in the presence of God, God can use every person mightily in different way. In different way. God is not using every person in same manner. But God is using the people, even the weak people. You know, in Bible itself, we read many examples. Moses was a weak person. He had many weakness. I mean, Apostle Paul, he was a weak person. He had many weakness in his body. But God used them tremendously. The reason is they were faithful in the presence of God. I mean, whatever they do, whatever they speak, and whatever they think, they were so faithful and very faithfully they were serving God. You know, in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, what is that? It is, it is a by-hearted Bible verse. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Amen. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. You know, the history of uh, Apostle Paul, when you, when you, when you read, uh, I mean, 2 uh, Corinthians, I think 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, and in that, in that portion, you know, we read that prayer, okay, Apostle Paul prayed three times in the presence of God to take away the thorn in the flesh, right? Apostle Paul prayed three times to take away the thorn in the flesh. But what was the answer of God? God replied like this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Praise God. Let us praise God for that verse, you know? God replied. What is the reply? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You know, most of the time, we are also praying in the presence of God, oh Lord, I'm so weak and I have this weakness. What can I do? I cannot do anything. But God says that, no, 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 keep it there. I mean, Paul was I mean, just praying three times to take away the thorn of thorn in the flesh. Which was the which was written the messenger of the Satan. It is written in there. Okay, but Jesus did not take took away take, take away those things. But Jesus said, no problem. Keep it keep it that. I mean, my grace is sufficient for you. My power will make you perfect in your weakness. So we may have many weakness in our life, but are we ready to keep that word? Are we ready to keep the word, or are we ready to obey the word? Then God will bless us. Amen. So that's what we see in this portion that God can use the weak people for the for tremendously for the expansion of the kingdom of God. Amen. So let us all surrender our life also in the presence of God, just like uh, the church at Philadelphia. They were having only little, little power or little strength. They were weak in many other things, but they were keeping and holding or obeying the word of God, that God used them mightily in that situation, okay? So that's what we read from this particular verse. And the second one, the second one is, they did not deny his name, the second appreciation. The second appreciation is, they did not deny his name or the name of Jesus. They did not deny his name. Now think about what was the situation of those days. You know, there was a church in the city of Philadelphia. 
but they had to face many attacks. They had to go through many persecutions. But in the midst of all those struggles, they kept their faith in Jesus and did not deny the name of God. That's what we read from these words. What is that? Even though they were going through many attacks, even though they were going through the persecutions, in the midst of all those struggles, they kept their faith in Jesus and did not deny the name of God. Amen. So many times we say that okay, we are not denying the name of God and we believe in God. But, but in, in certain times, you know, whenever we are affected by something and whenever we are going through the uh, troubles and struggles in our life, knowingly or unknowingly, we deny the name of Jesus sometimes. We do not know when it is happening, but that is happening sometimes in our life also. When we ask a question to God, why this is happening for me? That means, that means we are denying the power of God. We are denying the almighty God, the, 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 the sovereignty of God. That's what we read uh, from, uh, from the, the, the I mean, uh, first John chapter two, verses 22 and 23. And also from Jude chapter 4. We will read that those verses, then we will understand. First John chapter 20, sorry, first John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. First, we will read that. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? That this is an antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. In Jude chapter, uh, Jude, only one chapter is there in Jude, verse 4. Yeah, Jude 4. For certain the people have crept unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God in sens sensuality and deny our only master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, what, what, what does it mean? You know, uh, th these two verses when you read, okay, two portions when you read, it says that Jesus is only master and Lord. Jesus is only master and Lord. Do you think that the Father God is not uh, the master and the Lord? No, it's not like that. You know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three are one. We believe in Trinity. Okay, we believe in Trinity. At the same time, now... This is speaking about Jesus Christ, and Jesus, and it is it is mentioned there. Jesus is only Master and Lord. So Jesus also is God. Count in that way. You can consider in that way. Jesus is the Master, and Jesus is the Lord. Okay. And if somebody deny Jesus, he is a liar and antichrist. Right? It is written there in Jude, Jude chapter, I mean, verse four. Okay. If somebody is denying Jesus. You know, we say that, okay, uh, only only the unbelievers are denying Jesus or the, only, or the Muslim people are saying that, okay, uh, Jesus is only a prophet. Okay, they are saying. That's true. They are saying. We say that, okay, Jesus is the Lord and Jesus is God. Okay. But sometimes what happens in our life also, if you are denying Jesus and if you're denying the divinity of Jesus and if, if somebody is I mean, questioning the divinity of Jesus and the sovereignty of Jesus and the authority of Jesus, that means you are a liar. Okay? And especially it says that he is an antichrist. That also is written in Jude chapter okay, verse 4. Okay? So this is what we understand that when uh, the church of Philadelphia, they were not able to, they were not ready to deny the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? Even though they were going through the persecutions and troubles and the attacks okay so that's what we understand now we will go to the i mean uh, verses 9 and 10 verses 9 and 10 speaks about uh, uh, the encouragement okay so uh, jesus was i mean appreciating them for many things now he's encouraging uh, the uh, the people of uh, i mean church at philadelphia encouragement that is from verses 9 and 10. We'll read that verses. Let me go. Behold, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that, that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word and pa about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of, 
of trial that is coming on the whole earth, on the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. Okay. So what are the encouragement, I mean, encouragement words which is given for the Church of Philadelphia? Uh, the first one is in verse, verse 9. What is that? Some people will come from the synagogue of Satan, but they will come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved you. But as you know, about the Church of Philadelphia, God has a concern, a special concern, because they were keeping the word, even though they were go, I mean, going through the tough situation, they were keeping the word, they were obeying the word, and they did not deny the name of Jesus. So a special consideration is given for the people of Philadelphia. What is that? It's a, it, it, it's a kind of encouragement. What is that? Okay, I tell you that some people will come from the synagogue of Satan and they will come and they will worship before you or kneel down before you because they are the people, those who are attacking you. They are the people, those who are uh, punishing you. And they are the people, those who are saying some accusation against the Christian people. But now God is going to work and I, I, I have to give an encouragement for you that those people are coming to you and they will kneel down before you. That is going to happen. And they will know that I have loved you. That means they will know that God has a special concern about the people at Philadelphia. So that is the first encouragement. So that means you don't be worried about anything. Get courage from the Lord and something is going to happen. Something and miraculously going to happen in your church. Okay, so that's the first uh, in, in, encouragement words. And the second one is in the uh, verse 10. Verse 10, what is that? I will keep you from the uh, hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. That means the protection of the people of God, the protection of the people of God. So that protection is given for the people of uh, Philadelphia Church. That means I will keep you from the hour of trial. Okay. Trial in Daring, Pied and a Kalat, a Pied and a Kalat, Ningalanyan and Dium, Suchikim, Le, Ningalanyan and De, Avagasha Maitian Suchikim. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth, which speaks about the tribulation period the tribulation period of the seven years. Okay, so when that is coming, I will hold you and I will take you from this world and you will never go through the tribulation period. The church will be caught up and the church will be with Jesus Christ in heaven. Okay, so that's what we read from the book of Revelation. Many verses are there. I mean, before the uh, tribulation period, the church will be taken up, I mean, with Jesus Christ. So. Uh, especially the, the people at uh, I mean Philadelphia Church, Jesus is giving a particular message and encouraging words that I mean I will keep you from all kinds of the troubles and I will keep you during the time of the tribulation period. That means I will take you up. Okay, so the, the people of God will be with Jesus Christ. Now we will go to the uh, point number C. Point number C is warning. Point number C is warning. Point number C is warning. That is from verse 11. Yeah, Elsa, we'll read that verse also. Verse 11. <clears throat> I am coming soon. Hold fast of what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Yes, what is that? Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which you have that no man take your crown. Amen. That, means, that is the warning. Okay, so warning is what? I will come quickly. I will come quickly. Jesus is speaking about the coming of Jesus. That, okay, I will come quickly. Hold fast, which you have. Which you have means the faith and, uh, I mean, the word of God, which you received, okay? And the, the, the crown that, that is for you. The crown means not, not uh, the, the crown, which is uh, we are going to get uh, in heaven. The crown means 
you know the appreciation and the and the glory that we I, I have given for you in this world itself in this earth itself in your in your earthly life itself i'm giving you the i'm i'm filling the glory and the, i'm giving the i mean spiritual blessings upon you i mean you have to keep that okay keep that okay hold fast the faith and hold fast the word of god because i mean till i come okay you do not know when i'm coming but i will be coming quickly and you have to be ready for the second coming of jesus christ that is the warning which is given for the church at philadelphia and uh, we will i mean go to the promise of rewards also point number d point number d promise of rewards just we will write down those points and we will be explaining uh, those points maybe in the next class okay just we will write down the points okay uh, the promise of reward i mean there are there are four points are there uh, the promises of reward from revelation chapter 3 verse 12 we'll just read that verse also then we will conclude the one who conquers i'll make him a pillar in the temple of my god never shall he go up out of it i will write on him the name of my god and the name of the city of my god the new jerusalem which comes down from my god out of heaven and my own new name yes okay so there are mainly uh four points are there we'll just write down those points and i mean just remind me next class that uh, we didn't explain that just we are writing down okay what is that uh in revelation chapter 3 verse 12 itself it says that he who overcomes i will make him a pillar in the temple of my god and he shall go out no more and the second one is i will write on him the name of god and the third one is i will write on him the name of the city of my god and the fourth one is i will write my new name on him these are the four promise of words which is given for uh, the people of philadelphia church and that is the end of uh, uh this class and uh, we'll pray now afterwards uh, i'll be giving you maybe uh, five or 10 minutes for any questions or 